So good afternoon. Um, you know, it was, it's, it's a little bit daunting when being asked to speak to a, a room full of people that are very intelligent and very vested in this space um, and trying to decide how I can offer you value with my 15 minutes. And, um, you know, I'm a biologist, I'm a chemist, and I'm an engineer, so I'm going to save you from all of those things. And I'm, just, and I'm also a philosopher. So I thought it would be appropriate midway through the day to really talk about why we've got headwind. Why is there a resistance to improving the way our energy consumption functions, the way our society functions, the sustainability of our planet? And, um, you know, through the last 25 years of working inside multinational corporations, I, I've been able to at least develop some perspective of what is the pushback from? You know, why people resist things that seem so simple and obvious to all of us to improve not only our generations, but future generations and the, and the future of this planet. And so I really wanted to offer you an opportunity uh, to kind of look inside of a, an example of a large company and, and why they push back on innovation, why they push back on change. And it really comes down to a really simple belief that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that belief predominates large businesses. And the problem with that belief is that it sneakily allows businesses to accept massive underachievement in their businesses, not because they're bad, but because they're scared of the change. Change is something that most of us self-select and do very well, but it's not something our society does well. Change is something that's very difficult because it represents risk, it represents opportunities to fail, right? If they've learned something from their grandparents, it's something that provides a lot of security in, hey, they got through their entire career without failing. And when you speak to Fortune 500 CEOs, it's very difficult for them to do something different than that made them successful, right? They're rewarded for the things that have happened over the last 20 years because there's millions and millions and millions of dollars in their personal bank accounts that reinforce those behaviors. And so change is very difficult. And disruption is something that they don't want to embrace. It sounds like it's a risk to their success. And so my job, and I get paid by these very large corporations to be an internal disruptor, to come in and make them unhappy and make their lives difficult and make them think differently about what their profit and loss statement does for them. And it starts out as an example of why we would accept change, why we would purposely disrupt our business. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm preaching to a lot of choir, but I really want to drill down into how we can surmount some of the back pressure we get in society from implementing um, sustainable practices and innovation. And, and first of all is, let's understand change is, is every day, right? Change is a result of addressing mistakes that have happened, Change is a result of uh, adopting improvements that have been identified. Change is looking at one business that's improved and, and figuring out a way to apply it to another business. So change innately is, you know, I love the Rain, Wayne Gretzky quote, right? Change is about anticipating what the future demands of your business are so you can be successful. Sustainability done correctly isn't about removing profitability. It's about having a more holistic understanding of the opportunities to drive value in the marketplace. So when I talk to large companies, right, that get into marketing, this is what they think industry disruption is. You take the weed and you crank it 90 degrees, and look, it's a diamond, and it's great. And um, I think it looks a little bit more like this. Like, what can be a better poster child than Nokia that, you know, had half the world market share in cellular technology, and just, you know, a couple years later had 3.1%. And does everybody know what happened to Nokia? Everybody thinks it's Apple. So this is what um, drastic market change looks like from a P&L perspective. Um, this is a bad board meeting. But everybody thinks it's Apple. Look, Apple never changed its market share during the downfall of Nokia. It was Samsung. And not only was it Samsung, and this is important, is Nokia knew everything about Samsung when they had 50% market share. Samsung didn't change their strategy. Nokia failed to respond to it. And so disruptive innovation is Samsung coming and adding value to a marketplace that 
uh, wasn't adapting, it wasn't being its own internal disruptor. So when I explain disruptive change to my C-level staff, it's not taking a weedy and turning it 90 degrees and going out with a marketing platform. This is disruptive change. And this is what happens to almost every major company at some point in its life cycle. So my, the first slide with the horse, it, it's my favorite quote from Henry Ford. If I asked my consumers what they wanted, I would just give them faster horses. It's anticipating what the true reason people have transportation is and giving them something better thinking outside the scope of just bigger, faster horses. And the warning to large companies who don't want to embrace disruptive technologies is really evident in companies like Western Union, the telegraph company. They had the opportunity to buy Ma Bell when Ma Bell was the telephone company, and they didn't want to challenge their business model. And so Ma Bell completely disrupted and replaced Western Union as the communication of the day. Blockbuster, I remember, remember Blockbuster? All right, get in you, three days after it's due, drive to the store, put it in the slot, pay the fee. Blockbuster had the rights to internet spooling TV and movies, and they didn't understand why they'd possibly do it, and they passed on it. And five years later, we all go home and some sort of magical thing happens from our Wi-Fi to our TV, and there's movies. And Kodak, the poster child of, duh, sorry Kodak. But Kodak invented the digital camera and hit it because they didn't want to lose film sales. And once their patent ran out, Kodak is now a memory from the 70s. So it is much, much better for these large companies that are pushing back on disruptive innovation, on change, to be, right, we always think that, um, you know, that Walmart is this great conglomerate. Look at what Amazon is doing in the marketplace. When you listen to the CEO of Amazon, he talks about the marketplace in very new ways. He doesn't sell anything. He enables consumers to buy stuff. And his whole business is run on creating a service and a value and changing the marketplace. So with a little bit of time I've got, I want to show you what this looks like in the housing sector. And, you know, market disruption is happening constantly in the housing sector, just an example, right? Within, it's very difficult to get trained labor to build homes. It's very difficult to have all, you know, all the tens of thousands of homes that will be built get funneled through supply sectors, lumber, concrete, drywall, and it creates a commoditization of the building industry. So where's the value? Where's the innovation when everybody's using the same labor and the same materials, but yet code continues to evolve to drive water efficiencies, energy efficiencies, better structures, safer structures. Buyers evolve, right? HGTV is my biggest friend because I get a whole bunch of 36-year-old mothers of three going, this handsome boy with suspenders told my house could be magic, I want that. <laughs> and the good news is if they demand it, I can build it, but unless consumers align with the builders and expect more and want healthier and want safer and want more energy efficient, more, more responsible building, it just represents a danger to the home building industry that have made millions of dollars doing the same thing for the last 50 years. But the world is changing, right? It doesn't take anybody to, uh, a, a challenge to understand that if home builders don't respond to the way the labor force is adjusted, the way supply constraints are adjusted, the way the economic cycles work, the consumers, the builders that don't adapt to change, don't innovate, that don't disrupt their own business markets won't be here in another decade. The opportunity to inspire change really should come from inspiring the people who consume, right? Big businesses don't do anything. Municipalities and governments don't do anything. Consumers change the world. And when they understand they should expect a healthy environment, when they should understand that tens of thousands of dollars are wasted because of poor functioning buildings, poor functioning appliances, and they can use those tens of thousands of dollars on their family to take nicer vacations, eat better food, to take a little time off work, it changes the way they think value works. And simple things like, why are we still building in the mud? Why aren't we challenging the fundamental paradigms of what makes homes not perform to their ultimate level because we've got people with skill saws in square trees, nailing them together, and hoping they're gonna work. 
You know, this is a, this is a picture um, from Portland, and there's some really great home builders that are building really good homes, putting them on the back of the truck and dropping them on site. You know where this comes from? The fact that they're building 50-story hotels in Japan one at a time, modular, in cycles, and they can put up that hotel in about a week. And it challenges what good looks like. It challenges what best looks like. And those forces, whether it's, it's the Japanese home builders coming to America and demonstrating a new way of thinking about P&L, thinking longer term, thinking new business material, new materials, right? So many of the innovations that's happening are getting pushed through supply chains, not by instead being pulled by builders, they're being pushed as, hey, this is going to reduce your warranty. This is an opportunity to reduce failure due to weather environments. That there is new ways to think about identifying value in the market chain. And so my point today is that innovation doesn't have to be about give up, change your business model, stop uh, making as much profit. It can be consider the opportunity to have a, a better product than can your competitors create more value for your customers, and be innovative so that you're more successful in the future, right? It's not that difficult to want to save money. It's not that difficult to find an easier way for your consumers to buy and sell their homes. These innovations are happening all the time. The challenge is to get large corporations comfortable with change. And that understanding is, is change isn't a matter of risk, change is a matter of survival. So if you're not familiar with Sumitomo, you soon will be. They have the 10th largest home building company in the US. Sumitomo offers 30 year structural warranties. They spend more on research and development and housing in a year than the entire US housing industry does. They set a standard that I aspire to. And once they start challenging the marketplace, Builders will have to respond to the new market consideration that their buyers want, that buyers now expect a 30-year warranty. If this builder can do it, why can't that? Buyers expect their homes to consume half the water and a third the energy. If this builder can't, can do it, why can't that? And it's not just Sumitomo. Uh, there's great other international home builders like Sekisui that are coming in, and it's not just their acquisition of Woodside Home giving them a great market position in the West, but they own massive development companies throughout the US, which if you want to think about what's going to drive change, it's the innovation obviously that's happening in Asia and Europe that we need to get ahead of or be replaced by. So change is inevitable. Disruption happens not usually by the people that run the companies, but by outsiders. And so in order for us to push back against the headwinds about the corporations that are resistant to adopting innovation, resistant to understanding the opportunity to deliver better services, they need to feel safe. Because at the root of a resistance to change is that change represents risk to these utilities, to these corporations, to these home builders, to these suppliers. There is great resources out there. The, the DOT takes the best practices of tons of PhDs and gives it away for free, right? There's new materials. Like I, uh, I just finished building a community of homes that has no wood in it, airtight, watertight, hurricane resistant, R36. It changes the way buildings consume energy. And what's really interesting is when you start really challenging what does great look like? If I was going to disrupt the home building industry, where can I find trillions with a T of dollars of value? It's in the way, not just in reducing energy, in the way homes consume energy. How can we shift loads to reduce the diurnal peaks and valleys to create level loads? And the answer is, I've got a 6,000 square foot house right up the street that consumes the same amount of energy at 2 a.m. as it does in 2 p.m. It costs me less than 2% more to make. It saves the utility companies at scale, trillions. It saves that particular home buyer hundreds of thousands of dollars over the life of that home. Over a 30-year mortgage, the model is $187,000 of cost reduction just in utility cost. So dynamic change to me is, is challenging ideas unfettered by convention, but then folding it back into 
a successful business strategy. It can't be standing outside the gates and demanding industry change. It can be walking inside the gate and demonstrating the model that will allow them to continue to exist in the marketplace. So Gandhi's a smart guy. Expect this. Expect that at first they will ignore you. And then they do ridicule as silly ideas. And then when it gets really threatening and you're about to make them, force them to change, they'll fight you. That's the pattern. You all have experienced it over your careers in sustainability. But the long and the short of it is, is the world changes because it's better. Change towards something that allows us to continue to perpetuate. Change towards buildings that reduce operating costs. Change towards buildings that make you healthier and your family more secure. The great news about sustainability, it's not a compromise. It's an improvement. And what it requires is making the change safe to the people that control things like supply chains and building and construction. And it's very doable. It just needs a challenge and a business approach. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.